I am an only child. There are great things about being an only child. No fighting over the last cookie or how to decorate your room. You have all the peace and quiet you want, or if you want attention from your parents, you've got that. But when I was a child, I was curious. What would it be like to have a sibling? I heard my friends talking about a younger brother or an older sister complaining, but also affectionately. What would that be like, I wondered. And then, when I was 11, I got to find out. My parents had applied to adopt a child, and just before school started, Ronnie came to live with us. I had a seven-year-old brother. I was thrilled. We were great pals. I had no complaints. We walked together to school. I held his smaller hand in mine and delivered him to his second grade classroom. After school, I picked him up and we walked home exchanging our adventures of the day. My friends were surprised. Suddenly, Lucy had a brother. Is that your brother? It was Billy from across the street. He saw us walking to school. Yep, I said. Well, I didn't know you had a brother. <laughs> well, I do, and I squeezed Ronnie's hand. But this rosy picture was not shared by my mother. She had many clashes with Ronnie, and indeed he was not an easy child having spent his first seven years in an orphanage. He had insecurities and anxieties that I didn't see or understand. In the end, the adoption had been conditional. And finally, my parents decided that this would not work for our family. So 11 months, one month short of that adoption being final, Miss Wilson, the social worker, came to take Ronnie away. It was August. I was sitting outside. I had blue shorts and a striped t-shirt. I suppose I said goodbye, but I can't remember. But what I do remember is the sound of Miss Wilson's car door shutting. It was heavy, it was awful, it was final. I was not consulted. My parents explained later that that was to save me any guilt from being part of the decision making. Well, that might have been considerate. <laughs> it certainly didn't work. I was devastated. I was filled with fear and guilt. How could somebody that had been a member of our family for almost a year be sent away, be kicked out, flunked? What if that happened to me? What would I have to do or be to become ineligible to be a member of this family? And finally, why hadn't I done something to stop Miss Wilson from slamming that door and taking Ronnie away. Sometimes in my work as a mediator, that moment from long ago comes to the surface. If there is a marginalized voice, someone on the outside that needs to be on the inside, those old instincts kick in. I have a deep and hard-earned drive to make sure that every voice that needs to be heard is heard that no one is excluded for any reason. It is 6 p.m. in Prescott, Arizona. I am standing on a stage in front of a packed auditorium. Against the back wall are radical environmentalists ready to raise hell. They are dressed like badgers. Uh, maybe it was raccoons. I just, I just remember their beady eyes. I am there to facilitate a public meeting for the Forest Service on the subject of a proposed open pit copper mine in the beautiful mountains of northern Arizona. I introduce myself and I explain my role, which is to make sure that the Forest Service, who are cowering over there in the corner, <laughs> hear everyone who wants to speak and that everyone is treated with respect and given the time he or she needs. It's a big promise, but important for me to have some trust with the group. I begin. I call on audience members, every one of them angry and opposed to the mine. For hours, we hear objections on the grounds of economy, environment, health, 
culture, recreation, everything imaginable. It is nearing midnight, and I am sure there is nothing more to hear. And then a hand goes up in the front row. A diminutive grandmother stands up. I don't think it would be very nice for the visitors to look at that ugly pit. I ask if she's talking about tourists. We've spent a lot of time tonight talking about tourism. No. Maybe visitors, uh, your family members visiting from out of town? No, dear. I'm talking about the visitors. And then I see her finger pointing upward, and I think I understand. <laughs> She's serious, and the audience is starting to catch on. I feel every eye on me to see what I am going to do, and for a moment I am frozen. <laughs> and then it's clear. She has come to the meeting. She cares about the issue. She has a right to speak, to be heard, and respected and have her issue listed along with all the others on my flip chart sheets. I take a deep breath. I think I understand. You are worried about extraterrestrial visitors. I can feel some in the audience on the verge of laughing. Yes, she says. I just don't think it would be very nice for them to look down on this beautiful blue-green planet and see that big, ugly scar. I affirm that, indeed, she has raised an issue we have not talked about yet tonight. <laughs> and I ask if I might summarize it as interterrestrial concerns about the viewscape for extraterrestrial travelers. She says, yes, dear, that would be fine. <laughs> I turn and write on the flip chart. The audience is silent. I have defended her right to speak and be heard along with everyone else that evening. And my hope is that everyone goes home a little more open, a little more willing to accept the one who is different. Sometimes those voices from the outside are so painful that we want to avoid them. Barbara was a member of a group that I mediated to develop federal regulations for Indian boarding schools. She was a member of a tribe that had been badly abused by the US Army in the late 1800s. And at the beginning of each meeting, she was compelled to tell her story. The US government had brought blankets laced with smallpox, resulting in the death of thousands of her own people. I thought that it was important that she tell this story, but she ended every time with, I just can't believe I am sitting at this table with the US government. How can I trust any of you after what you have done to my people? For Barbara and the other natives at the table, this tragedy of 1890 was yesterday. But for the federal non-Indian attorneys at the table, it was ancient history, painful ancient history. They rolled their eyes, they looked at their watches, they squirmed in their seats. They wanted to get down to business. They wanted to write regulations. Barbara, I, Barbara was uh, compelled to tell this story every time, although I hoped that after I allowed her to tell it once, that would be the end of it. Finally, I understood. She was not being heard, and she knew it. When she began at the third meeting to tell the story, I interrupted. I told her that indeed it was important that her story be at the table in our negotiations. What she was telling, the painful history of the past, was indeed a reflection of the federal tribal relationship in the, not only in the past, but today as well. It took great courage, I told her, for her to tell that painful story. And it took courage for the rest of us to take it in at a deep level where we could really understand what it was like for her. This is how trust gets built, I said. And without trust, we won't have anything. I turned and pulled an empty chair up to the table and put it next to Barbara. I explained that this chair 
represented history. History was sitting in this chair. And I thanked her for reminding us that the past is always with us. Barbara whispered thank you. She didn't need to tell her story again. She had been heard. And we could go on with the business of drafting regulations. My mission as a mediator is to make room for those voices that are often absent or silenced in the conflict resolution process. If there is anything that I care about, it is making sure that those voices are heard. And I have, I have realized that taking in those stories from the other, from the ones that are different, taking them in at a very deep level can inspire the rest of us to go to that deep place, a place of honesty and authenticity where conflict resolution is more likely to happen. And so there are three things that I ask of people I'm working with and of myself. See each other as valuable human beings with something important to share. Treat those outside voices with respect and as equals at the table and include their stories, their perspectives, in that whole picture that we need to make the best possible decisions. When my brother Ronnie was taken away decades ago, my moral compass was set. Today and every day, I am mindful of those fringe voices, the ones that are on the outside that deserve to be on the inside. And as long as I am in charge of any conflict resolution process, no one will be excluded from the conversation. Everyone will belong.